Hi, <clears throat> welcome uh, to this um, event, this BCS event. It's a joint event uh, between the West Yorkshire branch and the London Central branch. Um, we have uh, the privilege of having Ron Ballard uh, speaking to us today. He's a database consultant and author, and he's going to talk about something that's incredibly relevant today, at least, um, about the blockchain, the winners and the losers. So we, we're going to start uh, in a couple of seconds. Uh, it'll carry on until eight. What you'll notice is that we have a chat forum. If you can uh, ask questions as they arrive, uh, as, as you think of them during the um, during the, the event, and uh, at the end or appropriate position uh, points within the webinar, we'll stop and we we will ask uh, Ron uh, those questions. Hopefully, we'll get through as many questions as we can before the eight o'clock cut off. Okay, thank you very much, and over to Ron. Hello, thank you all for coming along. Um, so we're going to talk about blockchain and Bitcoin, and mention Facebook as well. And Bitcoin and blockchains were a response to a problem. And the problem was the uh, bankruptcy of Lehman Brothers um, in 2008. Uh, that uh, made an impression on all of us. Um, perhaps a slightly bigger impression on me because I'd just come back from working in Turkey, looking for another contract here. And the um, person I've been working for, I had some people in Lehman Brothers and was planning to put me there. It didn't happen. But uh, this was you know, a very serious event that affected people all over the world. And it was caused by greed and corruption. Um, I don't think that's too contentious. And that led Satoshi Nakamoto to invent blockchain and Bitcoin. What he wanted to do was to eliminate these uh, potentially corrupt central banks and government institutions. And so he invented Bitcoin, very, very noble cause. Satoshi Nakamoto, nobody knows who he is or if that's his real name, but um, he's the man who did it. So we're gonna talk first of all about how blockchain works. The reason I want to do that, I'm sure some of you will, um, will know anyway, uh, it's not actually very complicated. And I think it's important to just cover what the technology does um, to set the scene. We're then gonna talk about the claims that are made for blockchain and Bitcoin and see if we think they're valid and the criticisms that are raised against them and check those. We'll also have a quick look at what Facebook is planning to do with its own cryptocurrency. You'll see that in quotes <laughs> all the way through and why the US government's worried about it and should we be worried? So first of all, how does blockchain work? Um, back in 1981, I was working on uh, an American database from a company called Syncom, and my job was to port it to the ICL 1900 series. Uh, porting meant reading the IBM assembler and turning it into uh, ICL assembler. Um, the reason I mentioned that and kind of set the scene about how old that is, is that both the technologies we're going to talk about were in use in that product. So chaining and hashing. Um, this is a simple chain, it's not a blockchain, the, the picture you can see now. Um, so data is moved to and from disks in blocks. And a block of data could be 1K, 4K, 16K, um, sorry, 16 meg, but they could be big. Um, and uh, Inside each block is a, a set of records, usually, quite a few records. And each block has a unique identifier so that you can, from your program, you can send, your low level program, you can send the address of the block and the hardware will return that block very fast, direct access. That was all pretty new in 1981. Um, so there's a block ID and to make a chain, you create another block with a pointer so the first one, so here we've got block Q pointing at block A, and then another one, block R pointing at block Q and so on. It's, blockchain adds something to that, which we'll, we'll mention in a moment. Uh, because 
with a simple chain like that, you can change it. And that's what our database did. It would let you insert a record into the, a, a new block into the chain, um, change existing blocks in the chain. And all you had to do when inserting a new block was just change the pointers. So in this case, block R has been changed to point to block F, and block F's the new one, and that's pointed to the old Q that was pointed to by R. So chains could be changed, and that's the thing that blockchain wants to stop you doing, changing the chain once it's been created. The other important technology is the hash, and I read that this goes back to 1953. <laughs> um, it's basically a way of getting a unique key from a string of bytes. Uh, so every character is stored in a byte, or maybe more than one byte if we're using UTF-8. Um, and a byte can hold a number between 0 and 255. So uh, the example here, my name, capital R, is represented by the decimal byte value 82. O is represented by 111. So we can take the numbers that are in each byte, add them up, and what we've done here is divide by 256 and take the remainder. We use that in the database to give us a block address. So that was one use of a hash. <coughs> um, they have other uses as we'll, we'll mention in a minute. Um, and you can see that with this hash, which only gives 256 possible values, you can get collisions. The last two rows there are different input strings, but they come out with the same hash. Blockchain uses what's called SHA-256. Um, well, it does for Bitcoin and most of the um, blockchain-based currencies. There are some that use other hash methods. But SHA-256, is an algorithm that takes a string of bytes just like this, but instead of just doing the simple thing that I did, goes through quite a complex process and will give you a number which is one of two to the power 256 um, values. That's 10 to the 77, so it's a huge, huge number. And that means that you're very, very, well, vanishingly unlikely to get two different strings that give the same hash number because there's so many to choose from. So given a chain and the SHA-256 hash function, we can make a blockchain. And what we do is to take the values in a block, all of them, um, and put those through the SHA-256 hash algorithm and we get out a long number. And the long number shown, that's a long hexadecimal number. And that is that is the correct SHA-256 hash for that uh, block ID, bar A, bar transaction, and so on. Um, we then make that the block hash of the first block in the chain, which is known as the Genesis block. The next block um, has that pointer has, has that the block hash of the first one as a pointer in it, and everything except the block hash itself in block Q is fed into the SHA-256 hash, um, and that generates a new number, which is the number of this block, and then we do the same for the next one up. What that means is that if you change a single byte in block Q, the hash of that block will be different. And that means that you'd have to change block R, so the pointer would be different. And that means you'd have to recalculate the hash of block R. And that means you'd have to um, change the pointer of the next block in the chain, and so on all the way up. So what that means is if you change a block in a blockchain, you have to change every single block that follows it. And that's what makes it very difficult to change. Um, that's not enough for uh, uh, blockchain because there's a lot more calculation that goes on. But that is the basic principle. The, the main parts of the calculation that go on are hashing of all the transactions and then hashing of all those hashes, just something to do to uh, 
deliberately cause more work. And we'll explain why that why it does that in a minute. So blockchain and Bitcoin were invented together. Um, blockchain is used for other cryptocurrencies and some other applications. And uh, the main cryptocurrencies in terms of size are Bitcoin, which is still the biggest, Ethereum, which is the next. And there are loads of others. In fact, there are 2,600 others when I checked last week. There are probably a few more since. So we'll look at the claims and criticisms for blockchain and Bitcoin together and, and, and most cryptocurrencies. But generally, we're referring to Bitcoin and the same things apply to the others. There are some cryptocurrencies that address some of the criticisms. Um, we can come back to those at the end if you're interested. The next thing about blockchain is um, what's called mining. I think that's name is just to make it sound kind of um, romantic and you know gold mining kind of kind of thing um, anybody can do it but uh, if you were to do it yourself and buy yourself a, a bitcoin miner we'll see a picture of one in a minute you'd be very lucky to make any money from it um, the idea originally was that there would be many miners and they're anonymous and they compete to add each block by doing uh, this proof of work, which is the calculation of the um, hash for that block. But then it, it does loads of other calculations as well to deliberately make a huge amount of work so that it's costing the miners a lot of work to actually be able to create a block. The first one that gets to add the block, um, which has to be approved by all, all the other peers or by a quorum of the other peers. Um, the first one to add, add the block takes a share of the transaction fees and wins a reward. We'll come back to what those are in a minute too. So I think that's basically how it works. Um, the claims that are made for Bitcoin uh, are many. <laughs> On Bitcoin's own website, it has this rather broad statement of how wonderful it is. It doesn't really tell you why it's wonderful. And it does say that it's you could not do the things that it does with any other system. We'll have a look at that claim. When you get to the uh, users of blockchain, the software companies that build blockchain systems, um, then you get some really what I can only describe as vacuous marketing statements like create smarter, more efficient supply chains, reduce fraud, verify transactions more quickly and create disruptive new business models with Azure blockchain services. The one that really bothers me is the one at the bottom from Antonio Guterres, uh, United Nations Secretary General, who is suggesting that um, the United Nations agencies should adopt blockchain to help the achievement of some sustainable development goals. He's a clever man, but he's sadly mistaken on this one. The technical claims that are made for blockchain are that the ledger is immutable. We talked about how, how difficult it is to change the chain, how expensive it is to change the chain. So that once you've written your transactions into the blockchain, it's in, for all practical purposes, impossible to change it. They also claim low transaction fees. They claim cryptographic proof. The use of the word cryptographic is very strange because the blockchain is not encrypted. SHA-256 hash algorithm is used a lot in cryptography, but it can also be used, for example, to generate keys in a distributed database system where you can't go to a center, central point to get the next key. Um, and there are other uses of it, but it's SHA-256 does not make it cryptography. Um, another claim from blockchain is about worldwide payments, um, as if nobody else could do that. It talks about fast peer-to-peer -peer transactions. We'll look at that. Uh, smart contracts and overall it's this the claim 
the strong claim is that technology is solving complex problems in the real world. The criticisms that are raised against blockchain are, I put it in red, lack of sustainability, because for me, that's the big one. Um, the second one bugs me as a long term software engineer, because I've spent most of my career trying to make databases go faster, um, to deliberately make things slow, just <laughs> grates against me. And there's some practical reasons as well as my kind of personal dislike of that. Um, blockchain has poor scalability, unnecessary complexity, really minimal functionality. And then when you look at Bitcoin, it's hugely volatile as a currency. And then there's fraud, as most of you will have heard on the news today. <laughs> um, that, that's, uh, we'll come back to that case. So let's have a look at those. First of all, the sustainability. Um, the picture there is a machine that's designed specifically for Bitcoin mining. Those fans are about five inches across. They make a hell of a noise, about the same as a diesel lorry at 40 miles an hour. Uh, it uses 2,500 watts. My laptop, um, which is you know a developer's laptop, so it's it's quite a powerful one, but it still only uses 10 to 12 watts. Um, so just, just one of those is going to uh, heat up your biggest room. This is what actually happens though in mining farms. So you can see racks and racks of machines like this. That, those two racks that we can see there in that one aisle are using several megawatts of power. There's nobody wandering around there because it would be deafening. Um, and in that particular Bitcoin mining farm, as in many of them, there are many, many racks like this. There's a great website um, called uh, Digiconomist. Um, it's, it's very, looking at anything to do with Bitcoin, um, one has to be skeptical and wonder if, if uh, this is true or if it's just hype or conspiracy theory or something. But this one does have does explain all the methods for um, calculating these numbers. It um, compares with other organizations that do calculations and discusses different methods of calculating how these things are used. Um, but it comes up with this uh, dashboard that's updated every day. So these are today's numbers. Um, they don't change that much uh, over time. Um, and on the top row, we've got the overall footprint of uh, Bitcoin for a year. Um, those numbers are huge, but they don't really, I find it hard to understand what, how, even how much that is. It's put comparisons with the, like the power is the same as that used by Kuwait. Um, it picks the country that's closest every day. Um, but the single transaction footprint, so this is the cost of a single transaction. Uh, a typical block in the blockchain has about 2,000 transactions in it, but each transaction costs this much. The carbon footprint, 243 kilograms of CO2 per transaction, that's about the same I, as I would use driving my car 1,500 miles. It's also about the same as over 600,000 Visa transactions, just one Bitcoin transaction. Uh, so you wonder how the miners can afford to do this uh, on what's supposed to be low transaction fees. So the transaction fees per block, so that's um, about 2,000 tra transactions. You can see there it's about 1,200 pounds. Um, but there's also a block reward, and that's paid to the, the miner that wins that block and gets to commit it um, in Bitcoin. When you turn that into pounds in today's rates, um, you can see uh, 
Actually, I should change that to July because <laughs> uh, but it's still the same because I just checked it today. It is £46,000. So there's a huge amount of, of money per block being added. Um, and, uh, and that's how they can afford to do it. You see those numbers have changed. Um, and that's because blockchain, every 210,000 blocks, the reward per block halves. These numbers are a little bit more than half because they're paid in Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin generally goes up when there's a halving event. Um, there's still a lot of money. Uh, <clears throat> so that's the um, the green, uh, well, the, the absolutely ungreen credentials. To move on to the performance, of, I said appalling performance by design. So it takes about 10 minutes on average to add a block to the blockchain. And a block contains, well, I said about 2,000 transactions. They add about 150 blocks a day. So that's about 300,000 transactions per day. Uh, I worked at uh, the UK's biggest payment card processor, and I believe at least one person in the audience did. Um, they processed, uh, when I was there, 30 million transactions a day, 1 billion transactions a month. Um, and that's you know, for the kind of payment cards that, that we would use, Visa, MasterCard, and so on. Um, the fastest relational database I know of, VaultDB, processes millions of transactions per second. Again, it's hard to comprehend, but that's what it does. Also, if you want to search through the blockchain and find a transaction that was committed before, it takes minutes because you have to go to the last block, look for your transaction there. If it's not there, you have to take the pointer to the next block or the previous block, Look for your transaction there. If it's not there, all the way down the chain until you find your transaction. There's no direct access at all. Um, so it is unbelievably slow and inefficient. Um, and it has minimal functionality. It's one dimensional. The searching I just mentioned is, is an indicator of that. We're used to having systems, databases, where we'll go in through an index and one or two disk reads we get our uh, record back in milliseconds. Um, that's not how it works with blockchain. And the longer the chain gets, it's getting longer all the time, and the further back you will need to go, the more work is necessary. Again, with a, with a database system, uh, the database unpacks the records from the blocks for you, and you ask for the records, and that's what you get. With blockchain, you have to do it yourself. It's just not scalable. Right, the volatility of the currency. So we can see here, um, this goes up to today, uh, from not quite from the beginning of, of blockchain. When it started off at about uh, £8.50 for uh, one Bitcoin, um, it went up to £14,500 per Bitcoin, and today it's about 7360 something. Um, but you can see those wild swings. You know, when you hear about the pound drops 2% against the dollar, wow, so the pound's crashed. But uh, with blockchain, it's, <laughs> it's hundreds of percentages, points. And this, shown by the red circle, is the reason for Bitcoin mania. Is the idea that if you buy Bitcoins now, you can make a fortune because it'll swing up. And you know some people did, quite a few people made quite a lot of money. And as you can see on the way down, quite a few people lost quite a lot of money. Um, that seems to be the only reason for its actual existence and survival, as far as I can see. The transaction fees, um, we talk about uh, low cost transactions. They're hugely variable, and the way they work is that when you make a Bitcoin transaction, you specify the fee you want to pay. 
and the miners pick the transactions with the highest fee to put into the next block. So if you want your transaction done quickly, you pay a lot. If you can wait, you pay very little. Uh, there are websites and applications that will tell you what the levels of fee are to get your transaction in a certain amount of time. But these are average transaction fees. Um, so they were in, in US dollars per transaction. Um, it's the fee is usually based on the, sorry, it is based on the number of bytes in the transaction. Um, so when the um, block reward halved on the 10th of May, I think it was, went from 12 and a half to six and a quarter Bitcoin per block. Um, the transaction fees went up from you know, like 30 cents up to six dollars. Um, that's the average. They came back down again, which is uh, interesting because although the price of Bitcoin went up, it didn't go up that much. But um, it's very, it's certainly not consistent low cost transaction fees. And then we come along to fraud. Um, well, this is uh, today's Bitcoin scam. Of course, these messages, these uh, tweets were not from Apple and Jeff Bezos, their accounts were hacked and um, they, the people sending this out did actually manage to get quite a few people to send them money. The bits that are um, pixeled out so you can't see them are the actual Bitcoin wallet, otherwise known as the account number, um, that you were to send the money to and a lot of people did it. Um, that's got nothing to do with the way Bitcoin works except that that account cannot be traced to a person. If it were a bank account number, a sort code and a bank account number, then the police could go to the bank and find out what that account was and who that person was and go and find them. But with Bitcoin, you can't. That's uh, actually today's scam is embarrassing for a lot of people, but it's a tiny one compared with uh, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars, but compared with some of the frauds that have taken place, it's trivial. I mean, these numbers are eye-watering. Huge amounts of, of money stolen from people. Um, and they just go on and on and on. So the immutable ledger was supposed to stop fraud. But I think, well, I thought a blinkered techie response, which says that you know, what we do in the computer system is what what uh, controls what happens in the outside world. That's not true. Um, when we had handwritten ledgers, then fiddling the ledger, fiddling the books and changing a value in the ledger could enable you to do a fraud. Now that we've got computerized ledgers um, with very strong security, logging, um, you'd be crazy to try and steal money from a bank by changing their ledger. You'd get caught really quickly. So it almost never happens. Uh, it might, you might have ledgers being fiddled in small companies, but for large companies and, and, and financial institutions, that is not gonna happen. You don't need blockchain to do that. They've got systems in there that do stop people changing the ledger. What happens with most frauds is like the one today where, um, they're just fooling people and getting them to send money somewhere. And uh, there are many ways of doing frauds and I'm not an expert on them because I never do frauds, but um, they're not to do with the computer system. Generally. So while blockchain can say, these transactions that were written to this block will never change, it's got no way of telling that those transactions are actually valid. They call it validation, they have no way of telling that that transaction represents something in the real world. And because of the, uh, the only bit that is secret is um, what the, who the wallet address belongs to, who the, who the Bitcoins belong to, that's, that's uh, anonymous. You can't find out the person. That's made it easier to get dodgy transactions recorded. 
and that's caused these huge frauds. So it's a complete failure. That part. Um, since Bitcoin themselves made such a big deal of it being, you know, an immutable ledger and it would stop fraud and stop all this corruption, it's a bit much when one of the core developers says it's not the place of engineers to sort through police reports and finance judgments on each transaction as good or evil, which is what he said. Another kind of fraud that is worrying to uh, many people is the fact, is the, the idea of the, the miners as lots of independent peers all checking one another's work and coming to an agreement about whether something's valid or not. Most mining is now done by pools. So this is, you can go and watch um, the transactions being committed and see who's, who's getting them. And you can see this was just taken at, at random. I just opened the screen on uh, probably BitApps, I think it was, uh, and watch the transactions going through. And you can see the pools are there. The pie chart uh, at the bottom right is more um, telling because it shows you huge chunks being made by uh, huge chunks of transactions being made by pools and pool pooling slash um, they're all f2 pool they're all pools of miners and although the mining operations the actual machines doing it are in various countries in the world um, china dominates the mining pools the organizations that are running it so given that these pools are very large and several of them are owned by the same people, um, there is a big risk of what's called a 51% attack because the validation of, of uh, blocks is done on a consensus basis. If you have 51% of the votes, you can change the ledger. So uh, that, even that bit doesn't work. Um, right, Facebook. So uh, Facebook has now decided to have its own cryptocurrency called Libra. Um, and this is what they said about it. You know, wonderful things. It's going to facilitate things worldwide and be connected and it will all be wonderful. Um, well, do you trust Facebook to look after your private data, let alone your money? Um, they started off with a consortium of people, of organizations that were going to be in Libra. Um, France, Germany and India very quickly said that they would ban Libra. And then some of the key uh, partners in this consortium, PayPal, eBay, Visa, Mastercard, Stripe, pulled out by October 2019. Others have pulled out since. Uh, the US Congress doesn't like it and Donald Trump doesn't like it. And I think that's possibly the only thing that I would agree with Donald Trump about. I don't like it either. Um, this comes from uh, an interview in a CNBC uh, broadcast, which you can find at the link there. Uh, and it said um, that, whoops, sorry. Is that better? Um, Facebook is going after the world's unbanked population. Those are mostly people in poor countries and mostly women, more than half women. It's 1.7 billion people and uh, Facebook says it can leverage them through reliable internet, internet infrastructure of mobile phones. Uh, and it has a lot to gain by winning over the unbanked with its own digital currency. So, would you want to be leveraged by Facebook? Uh, I think that's a very serious threat. And I think what we should do is stop all the proof of work blockchain systems right now. Primarily because we're in a climate emergency and they're contributing as much power to do something that's completely unnecessary as a significant country. That's just unacceptable you know i'm trying to use a car get a car that uses less fuel or switch to electric and they're just wasting a whole country's worth of power um however now the fact that i would like to stop it is um 
not very effective since Bitcoin now has a market capitalization of 168 billion dollars, US dollars, as that's today's value. So uh, I don't know how you do it. But um, we can write to politicians and green charities and development charities and newspapers and climate change activists to make sure they understand this because the green movement isn't really making a lot of noise about this, which surprises me. I've written to the green charities that I support um, and I've had mixed responses. Some, and, oh, we're just too busy to look at that. Uh, another one said, yes, they, they agree, but can I write to the US branch because they're trying to convince them and they're bad. We can certainly find safer ways to help the unbanked. That's a, a very noble thing to do. Uh, we can move charitable donations to charities that do not accept Bitcoin. I'm shocked that UNICEF accepts Bitcoin and makes a big deal of it. Uh, I don't think it should. I, although I think UNICEF does some great work, there are other charities that do great work and don't accept Bitcoin, so they get my donations there. And uh, please don't say leveraging the power of blockchain. It's nonsense. I think we should say instead, just how exactly does blockchain help? So that's uh, the end of my talk, and I look forward very much to your questions and comments. I assume somebody's going to take over at this point. Yeah, sorry, hi. Um, okay, so if, you have any, sorry, if you have any questions, um, can you put them in the chat now, please? And we, we will pass them, off, pass them on as they come in. Okay, it's Pip here. Um, I have a question, Ron, to, to present to you. So uh, we have uh, a question that from Matthew. Non-cyclical non is a term I have heard before in relation to blockchain. Can you speak about how this is relevant or possible? Um, I'm not even sure what that means. I mean, uh, no, I, I, I'd be guessing. Uh, my guess is that it, uh, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Sorry. <laughs> okay, there's another question. Uh, what exactly is the advantage of using Bitcoin, especially when considering the costs involved from Peter? Um, I, the only reason um, is, is gambling, basically. I did speak to um, there's a, a blockchain company um, not very far from where I live and uh, they very kindly um, spent several hours with me explaining what they're doing. They are trying to do things differently. I'm not entirely convinced that it's going to uh, be a worthwhile thing, but they are, they are trying to do things differently. And uh, I, th they told me that it, it used to take them minutes to, to search their chain and uh, and so I said well why not just dump it into a database it's not that big um, you know it's a fraction of, of what big financial organizations do the amount of money is big but the amount of blocks isn't that big for a, a modern database and they said yeah we've done that now and so now we can find a transaction in a fraction of a second um, so so I said well why did you use blockchain then? And they said, We've ne we would never have got the funding if we said we were going to do this with a database. So there's all this fiction about uh, blockchain. Um, for a while, it was certainly true, I don't know if it's still true, that if you had a company and you said, a, a public company, and you said that you were going to use blockchain, your share price went up. It's, it's just hype. It's absolute nonsense. It's, it's <laughs> there we go. I hope that answers your question. Hi, Ron. I have a question. Um, with all the quantitative easing and massive government expenditure at the moment, could Bitcoin be a suitable hedge because traditional currencies might not fare so well either? 
Uh, that's a question for someone who's an expert in finance rather than someone who's an expert in technology. Uh, I would think not because it's it's there's the potential for high rewards, um, but there's huge risk. Uh, you've seen, you saw from that chart how how the currency just goes up and up and down. Um, people were saying that after the recent halving, that the price of uh, Bitcoin would go up. Um, it stayed pretty much the same. It, it went up a little bit. Um, so trying to predict where it's going in the future is pretty hard, and I certainly wouldn't put my money in it. I was just going to say that, um, there's uh, uh, something here about the uh, you mentioned the 51 percent attack. Are they yep. real threats and how 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 common are they? That's from Matthew. Uh, I don't think there's been one yet, not certainly not on any of the big. Um, the big uh, blockchain currencies, the one I talk to is is fairly small and. Um, They've really well. They they've stopped the proof of work. They found another way of um, of getting independent verification of their transactions, which is much cheaper. Um, but because they, one of the things that pushed them to do that was when they saw that um, their the the miners on their smaller um, currency were actually starting to dominate it very quickly, and they realised that one company that owned about three pools could actually have, have rewritten their blockchain. And uh, so that's, that motivated them to get off that method altogether. Um, so it's a question of scale with Bitcoin. You would need a huge amount of money and a huge amount of control to actually take over Bitcoin. But um, it's getting to the point where that, that could, it's feasible. Ron, there's a few questions around the advantages of blockchain um, on what these could be. Um, and um, one person suggests, could it be that uh, people's ignorance of the the concepts behind? Sorry, people's ignorance of the concept of? Uh, uh, um, people's ignorance of uh, or misunderstanding of the uh, the concepts of blockchain and how it operates. Yeah. Um, well, I've, yes, I've tried to explain that. It, it isn't a very complex um, concept. Um, the algorithms it uses are, are very complex. Um, but there's no, there is no regulation. Um, the whole know your customer thing. Uh, that fraud that happened today could not have happened if with any um, country's currency and any any uh, national bank, for example, because they they will check transactions like that and they will they will stop them. Um, there's a huge amount of work being done on, on regulation of banks, and although they might complain, they they follow it and uh, they have to follow it, and so. The anti-money laundering is very strong, and blockchain just doesn't have that. So it doesn't have that thing that was its main claim to fame, and it's incredibly damaging to the environment, um, and it's hugely volatile. I, I don't know why you would touch it, except that you might get lucky, but uh, <laughs> you know you might as well go to the betting shop room. Really. Hi Ron, um, I've got a question from John. What effect will future increases in processing power have, if any? Yeah, this is um, so the the miners, the mining machines do get more powerful and slightly more economical, but it is an arms race because. Uh, if you're the one who wins, you have the latest kit and you have the most of it and you win most of the blocks, then you get most of the block rewards and you make money and the smaller smaller ones don't. Um, so it, the emphasis is more on 
power they talk about giga hashes per second that these things can do um, and the uh, power consumption reduction is not that significant if you halved it which yeah, it's not going to happen if you halved the power consumption it would still be a, an ecological disaster so i don't see that as a, a benefit the idea that you should have all this expensive kit wasting power to do something completely unnecessary for something less good than the, the financial system we've got at the moment. I don't say the financial system we've got at the moment is perfect, but it's better than Bitcoin. It's There's just no point to it at all. Um, there's a, quite a long question here, but um, it says it's from um it's from robert and it says what are your views on using blockchain for non-currency related use cases for example the uk government is looking at using blockchain technology between departments for customs related related uses are your views shared with the, these use cases as well as it as using it for currency i i've seen some of those and i um, do know someone who worked in an insurance company where they were talking about um, using blockchain and things like, um, you know, you can take, uh, if someone's insuring a diamond, for example, you can take an x-ray of a diamond and that is like a fingerprint. So if someone stole it, you could actually take an x-ray of a, a suspected stolen one and match it up and so on. And they were saying that they put that in the blockchain because then it couldn't be changed. Well, you can put it in a database and it wouldn't be changed. Um, you, know, you can put good security around databases with that so that they, they can't be changed. Um, and that's, that's not where the problems happen. So, um, and the idea of uh, um, customs uh, and uh, you know, tracking goods, um, so you know something's put on a truck in uh, Slovakia and it's got some certificate to say that it is what it is and it was made by the people who, who said they made it and the cost was this and all the other things that you need to know and it's passed all the safety checks and whatever um, and you can put that certificate in a blockchain or you can put it in a database and someone can still change the actual goods or forge the certificate the blockchain only makes the artifacts unchangeable it doesn't make the real things out there in the real world unchangeable so i would say there is no good use of blockchain there's nothing you can do with blockchain that you can't do with a relational database and some other technologies uh, relational database uh, because it's mature and rock solid these days it's been around a long time and it works well so why use something that's so complicated and expensive and doesn't give you anything new hi ron um i've got a question from tom why does it appear that the media is providing the halo for blockchain what's in it for them i don't know <laughs> um it's a it is a mystery to me how this hype has been allowed to to, to, to grow it's uh now i'm not the only person saying this um and uh but but somehow i can see other there are other bad things that have happened in uh in this country and uh in the other one i visit most of the states that are also based on complete myths and the media just seems to go along with it. But um, I don't know. There are good elements of the media that do challenge things and uh, that can be quite hard to find them. Ida has been in, in touch and says, in my opinion, what's giving the whole blockchain space a bad rap is cryptocurrency. Can I highlight that more? that there's a whole world of interesting use cases for non-cryptocurrency blockchain that would do well uh, at least to give a look at, chief of which is reconciliation. Um, I, 
Well, I, I don't I don't agree with that. There was an interesting article in the BCS magazine, but there, there was an issue that was uh, all about blockchain. And one of those uh, use uh, one of the cases they talked about was a uh, researcher, a medical researcher, I think, who would get the results of his um, experiments and trials. And when he got the results, he would uh, put those in a file, calculate a SHA hash on it, which is really easy to do. Um, there's, there's all kinds of uh, software that will, will let you do that. And send the results and the hash to the people who would be uh, reviewing his, his work uh, and the people who would potentially use it. Then he did all the analysis, all the statistical analysis, and um, when he finished that, he sent that um, to them, and uh, and the data set again, and they could check that the data was exactly what he sent them, that he wasn't cherry picking. Um, so that was an important case of, of reconciliation. But he didn't have to have a blockchain for that; it just took a hash. If you take, if you get a, if you download. Uh, some software from uh, any of the open source sites. Um, they will give you a, a hash for the file that you're downloading. So you can check that when you get the file on your computer, you can run that, that hash again, calculate the hash for the file you've received. You can make sure it's the same as theirs. So it didn't get broken coming across the internet and it didn't. you didn't get a fake copy. So that kind of reconciliation you can do without having black blockchain. Um, I've, I've, I've yet to see a use case that would actually uh, benefit by using blockchain. Um, I haven't seen one. Uh, if you've got one, I'd be interested. You can, you can send it to me. <laughs> That'd be great. But uh, I, I haven't seen one yet. Um, <clears throat> so. Should we then be, this is from Tom again, should we then be convincing software companies to stop building or bidding on projects uh, based on blockchain technology? Absolutely. I think it's shocking, absolutely shocking that companies like IBM and Oracle and Microsoft and SAP, the big software vendors, services vendors, should actually be promoting these systems. It's it's awful. That's These are the people who are supposed to be the experts in giving advice to their clients. And if a client comes along and says, we want this blockchain application, they should be saying, are you sure that's really what you want? Why do you want to do that? And we can build it for you. If you want us to, we can build it for you. But they shouldn't be promoting it as something magical that will solve their problems. It will only cost those clients more. So I, I think that's a, that's, well, it, it's shocking. <laughs> I don't know what else to say politely. <laughs> So we have a more. question from Darren. Uh, can you say a little bit more about smart contracts introduced as one of the key claims? And we've only got several minutes left. Just okay. to find track. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I sort of changed that bit. Um, so it's quite difficult to find out what smart contracts are supposed to be. You know, they talk about automated um, payments, um, repeating payments and stuff. You can do that with your bank. Uh, you know, I have variable. Well, when I ran my own um, consultancy, I used to pay VAT, I had a variable direct debit to um, HMRC, pay my VAT bill. Um, I haven't seen anything that, uh, um, that kind of goes beyond that. You can certainly implement those kind of contracts in, um, in other systems. And uh, I, it was a question I asked to these people that I met who run the smaller blockchain and and they said well actually nobody's really doing smart contracts very much and which is probably why I couldn't find anything about them um, it's just as far as I can tell it's just another bit of hype and I can't see any feature of blockchain that would make a, a smart contract any more feasible than it would be anyway So. 
So just one last question before we leave. Um, IOTA is supposed to cut the cost and the speed of transactions. Is it is it blockchain and will it be worthwhile? This is from Lee. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. You, you broke up on the first bit. Could you repeat that? So I, IOTA is supposed to cut the cost and the speed up, speed up transactions. Is it blockchain and will it be worthwhile? That's from Les. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I haven't heard of that, so <laughs> I'll have to look it up. Um, I think it's it. I can't it's see it. how you can make transactions cheaper by doing it with blockchain. When you can okay. do six six hundred thousand Visa transactions for the cost of one blockchain transaction, I don't understand how blockchain is ever going to make your transactions cheap. Well. Thank you very much, Ron, um, for that talk. That's all we've got time for today. Um, it was really interesting. Um, what is it, actually quite a hard job to uh, to do, answer the questions because there was, um, I guess, fifty or sixty questions that we had to we had to sort through. Um, we've had a lot of attendees today. It's been really interesting. Um, it's been, I, I think, it's been a very successful event. Thank you very much for your help. Okay, Ron. thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to do. It. Thank you. Some okay, some interesting you. questions. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay. So that's it. And we'll hopefully see you again. It's been a joint event by West Yorkshire and London branches. And hopefully we'll have uh, we'll join up again in the future. Yes. Have a good evening.